Hello and welcome, GEDmatch members, GEDmatch family. Really excited to uh, have you all on this webinar today. Uh, really excited to have David, David uh, Alan Lambert from American Ancestors on this webinar with us. It's a real privilege and honor that we have him uh, and that we're partnered with American Ancestors. So, um, David, welcome. Glad that you're here. I'm honored yeah. to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got a packed house. Um, we're going to hit our thousand attendee max. Uh, we're, we're almost up to that. And we, fingers crossed, should be also live streaming on our YouTube channel and our uh, Facebook page. So, um, so we're going to be, David is going to be sharing with us an overview of American Ancestors and, and all of the amazing resources that, that they have. And uh, as for Judmatch, we've got a lot of great um, uh, resources when it comes to DNA and, and digging into your DNA and all the tools there. But genealogy uh, resources outside of the DNA side is really important to, to understand. So I just want to share with you all uh, a bit about David, because again, this is uh, really an honor that we have him. So he's been on staff with American Ancestors um, since 1993. He's their organization's chief genealogist. He's an internationally recognized speaker on the topics of genealogy and history. Uh, he's published many, many articles in the, the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, New Hampshire Genealogical Record, uh, the Rhode Island Roots, Mayflower Descendants, and the American Ancestors Magazine. He's authored or, and or co-authored and the published genealogies presented to some notable people like David McCullough, Ken Burns, Angela Lansbury, Michael and Kitty Dukakis, Nathaniel Philbrick, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and the Boston Mayor, uh, uh, Thomas Menino. He also has published 11 books. Um, and his area of, of expertise is New England and Atlantic Canadian records of the 17th through 21st century, American and international military records, DNA research, Native American and African American genealogical research in New England. So, David, again, really uh, an honor that uh, you're here with us. I'm really excited to see what you have to share with our members about how American ancestors can help them in their research. Well, I'm delighted to be here and a welcome uh, from our president and CEO, Ryan Woods, uh, to all of our American ancestors uh, members that may already be uh, on board and being a member with NEHGS and American ancestors. Uh, also, do would like to know that you are going to probably hear about a special uh, about membership uh, that Tom is going to tell you, and we would welcome you as a member as well with a special discount. So I will uh, close my camera down because it's more important to see my slides than to see me, and I will uh, proceed with the uh, presentation. <clears throat> Uh, it's been an honor to be uh, a part of American Ancestors for uh, going on 31 years. Um, I can still remember when we um, did our presentations by PowerPoint uh, and uh, before that, not online, and before that, on transparencies. So um, doing something like this when I first started would have been next to impossible. So the overview of American Ancestors kind of give you a taste of our organization, what we're all about, and what we can do to help you. Awesome. And real quick, if I could just jump in, David. So for anyone who has a question, we have a, a question feature as a part of the GoToWebinar platform. So we will have a Q&A time at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to provide, uh, you know, submit your questions there. And, and we will be uh, doing our best to answer as many of them as we can. Be delighted to answer whatever questions you might have, or maybe a tip on a brick wall that you might have. <laughs> So we're gonna talk about what is American Ancestors. Uh, we're gonna go over our mission, our website, different educational materials, what we can do for you and our catalog. I'm gonna also talk about um, some of our online record collections. Uh, we have over 1.4 billion searchable names on our website currently and continuing to add more and more each week. And I'll talk uh, also about our digital library, whereas our physical building is currently closed for part of this year, as we expand our footprint on Newbury Street, uh, we will be uh, extending from 99-101 Newbury Street to 97 through 101. Uh, we have a new building being constructed right next door uh, to our existing building in Boston. So our mission at American Ancestors is to advance the study of family history in America and beyond. NEHGS educates, inspires, and connects people through our scholarship, collections, and our expertise. 
One of the things I like to say about American ancestors, um, besides having uh, a physical location and staff who can either come to your organization or have consultations with you, you don't physically have to be in Boston to enjoy the benefits of membership. New England is our name, but we're far more than that. We started in 1845, so next year we will be 180 years old, and we're the oldest genealogical organization in the nation, and even in, for that matter, in perhaps the world. Uh, our organization spans membership throughout the continental US and Canada, as well as Europe, so without a doubt, gathering material that reflects all people's ancestry is one of our main focuses. And currently we're also undertaking 10 million names to look at the genealogies of those enslaved Americans uh, that we have um, studied for so long, but now to do a concise examination over the next years to tell their story as well. Our research center, as I say, is expanding. Uh, if you see the weeping willow tree to the right, the old building that stood next to ours has been demolished and we are ex building our 97 Newbury Street location. Uh, and this is going to have both interactive displays, uh, new office space, educational area will be expanded uh, and so much more. Currently our building uh, occupies eight floors uh, it has eight floors and occupies actually six of them. Um, the new addition will include this brand new discovery center. Currently we have over 200,000 books. Uh, we again have been collecting since 1845. In our manuscripts, we have over 28 million. We also have thousands of microfilm, various uh, periodicals from around the globe dealing with genealogy and history. And again, our databases on American ancestors with the numbering of over 1.4 billion searchable names. And the other thing that we have is our staff. I think one of our most important assets is our staff who come from a wide range of backgrounds. May it be their own genealogy that they've expanded their knowledge base on and share with our members. And they do that through Again, not just on the reference desk, through lectures, through consultations, and through even our paid research service. And I'll tell you a little bit about our expert assistant, assistance now. So for expert assistance, you don't need to be a member to use our Ask a Genealogist Live. You could sign up for complimentary membership and uh, ask a question of our staff. Uh, we have that open Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So after this presentation, you're more than welcome to go on and uh, you'll have to sign up for a free account and then uh, we'll be able to assist you. Maybe we can give you a tip on breaking down a brick wall. And again, that's really easy to find. If you go to AmericanAncestors.org, go to expert, and then from there you can actually click on I uh, ask a genealogist chat. Also, one of the things that we have is a way that we can actually work with you one on one. Now, I did say our building is closed, but normally we would have the availability of sitting down with you and reviewing in person genealogical questions or problems that you've been faced over the years. But using this QR code, you can book a one on one consultation with myself or two other of my colleagues as we do these through Zoom or even the telephone if necessary uh, and assist you in a variety of ways. Certain levels of paid membership with American Ancestor come with complimentary time. You can learn more of that on our membership tab on American Ancestors. Uh, and also you can do paid consults as well. If you wanna have us do the research for you, and that goes all the way from having a little bit of research done for your application for the Mayflower Society or the Daughters of the American Revolution, or maybe you've had a struggle trying to put your genealogy together or have it organized. Hiring our research services is an amazing way of accomplishing those goals. And again, we offer this research for hire option as well. You can also request a speaker like myself. I am uh, often traveling around the country or sometimes just sitting here in my home like I'm doing now and offering a virtual lecture, which will come with a handout uh, and be on a variety of topics. You can learn more about that under request a speaker on American Ancestors under expert help. So let's begin. This is American Ancestors website. And we're very excited for our upcoming April uh, board meeting where we're gonna be honoring Ron Howard. And 
along the top of the American Ancestors page is where you're gonna find the various tabs that I had mentioned, especially expert help, which is down here on the right next to tools and publications. But let's talk about a few of the things that are offered. Now, if we go to search, you're gonna start into searching our databases, which is of course, as a genealogist, where you're gonna probably spend most of your time on our website. From there, the search screen will open up and you can simply go to search. And the drop down is gonna give you a variety of options. We're gonna talk about how you can get into a variety of databases by name. We'll also talk about the external databases. These are party shared databases where we have worked with other institutions to share their databases with our members and you can access those at home. Also our library catalog of all of our offerings between manuscripts and books and microfilm as well as digital and our digital library and archive including the Jewish Heritage Center. So let's begin. On search all databases will give you a broad sense of putting in a name and seeing where it falls in all of the different databases we have on American Ancestors. And my biggest tip is less is definitely more. So if you were looking for James Albert George Lambert, born in 1887 and born in Saint Pierre Island, France, and that he is a birth you're looking for, that might be a little bit more information that you want to put down. Because if you hit search, how about if one of those middle names is enlisted? or maybe that place isn't exactly how it's listed in the record. Maybe it's a family story that they were born in 1887 and they were actually born in 1888. You can adjust the years, you can limit the information, you can also use Soundex or do an exact search. So try it at various different ways. Don't just pull in all the information and again, less is more in this case. So looking at our databases through A to Z, we can see a variety. And this is of all the different databases we have, they're gonna pull now uh, under alphabetically. But you can also select only free databases. So as a guest member, you may select that option, sort of test driving American ancestors. And if you find that you have hits that will be in paid databases that are part of our uh, membership, uh, then you can essentially uh, go from there. You can also go in and find out more information. Is it an actual textual database as a piece of paper with the corner folded over? Or is there actually images of the documents? And that would have reflect the having a camera. And again, you can search by database name. So if you wanted to find out what we had for Argentina, you can put in Argentina and then it will come up or Alabama or maybe a publication like the American Genealogist. Our external databases from home are really an exciting way of not having to subscribe yourself to a variety of databases that would cost you more than a typical membership to American ancestors. Those include Heritage Quest Online, the Marquis biographies of Marquis Who's Who, uh, Everyday Life uh, in Woman in America, History Geo, Jewish Life in America, uh, databases in, on slavery, abolition, and social justice, the Gale in Context in the US, a variety of newspaper databases, including early, news, early American newspapers, Series 1 by Redex, which is tremendous, where you can actually see the newspaper articles and do a search on your ancestor's name, a location, and find so much more. For so much more than just names and dates in our family trees. So why not add the context of what was going on during the dash in their gravestone date, not just the dates themselves. And there's a variety of databases that have Quebec ancestry. So this is the notarial database and genealogy Quebec. Those all come part of your paid membership with American ancestors. And again, we have our own digital archives besides what we have um, available for databases, we have our library and archives. And this is both a combination of our own collections and the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center. From there, you can get to educational materials for genealogy research as well. And this includes subject guides, research templates, say if you want to know how to write in register format, or maybe do something as an Anantafel, which is an ancestor table in German. Um, the other things you can get are our town guides, video library of past lectures and programs. So if you couldn't have occurred 
uh, attended our lecture, say, six months ago, well, it's probably online on our website, and you can view it from there, and also see the syllabus materials in most cases. And also, you can see all of our current online courses that are coming up. From there, you can go to our research guides at American Ancestors and find the various guides that may aid you in your genealogical research. You can also download the research templates, such as blank forms, such as pedigree charts, family group sheets, a research plan, how about a research log, and census worksheets that may uh, help you as you organize your genealogical notes. And we know in genealogy, it produces a lot of paper, so why not have some digital forms you can print out to assist you in organization? We also have a section on town guides where you can find out a lot on various New England communities when they were settled and what the parent town is. It's always good to know when the town was incorporated because you might be looking for records that predate the incorporation of a town. And now you can find out what town it came from. My own hometown came from Dorchester prior to 1726. So if I want to find the early records of the earlier families, I need to use a guide like this. We also have a variety of events. Uh, upcoming in March, we have a research tour to Archives 1 and Archives 2. Myself and my colleague Rhonda McClure will be joining a group of genealogists on this paid research tour where we will uh, visit both the traditional archives on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., as well as Archives 2 in College Park, Maryland for more recent records that you may have pondered on in your genealogy. We also have courses on demand, and this is sometimes brand new material or sometimes very popular courses that we have reintroduced and allowed our members to sign up to, uh, to be involved in. Let's talk about our library catalog. So from the search screen, again, you can go down and the fourth option is library catalog. Simply by clicking on the library catalog will bring up our search screen. Well, you can search on a variety of things, keyword, title, author, the subject, call number in advance. So the title of the book may be a partial title. Maybe it is the genealogical research on families in Watertown, Massachusetts. Or maybe you happen to know the author is Henry Bond. Or maybe you know the subject you're looking for is witchcraft in New England. So, or maybe you already have the call number because you wrote it down on a slip of paper that you never got a chance to look at it. Then you can see if it's available online. Some of our books actually are available as links so you can view them from home. Here's an example of a variety of different items that we have available. The top one for Middleborough, Massachusetts Vital Records. We have it uh, as part of our online database. So sure, when the library is open, you can come and grab the book off of our seventh floor reading room floor, uh, floors, or you can click and look at it right now from home. Also, we have a variety of other collections as well, uh, such as the Vital Records of Clarksburg, Massachusetts, uh, which is also available on microfiche, not a book, but you can also look at our database available on American Ancestors. <clears throat> You can go into a further research. In this case, I'm doing a keyword search under New York and finding just a variety of different items that are available for New York, but have the term D colon ahead of it. That allows it to have it sorted on ones that our databases are online. So that's why we only have 31. We have hundreds of items for New York in general, but this limits down the search just a little bit to e-resources. Uh, as you see, we have New Netherland Connections. We have that as an online database, the records for the Reformed Dutch Church, as well as a manuscript, which we have material on, on um, Henry L. Bazell and his family papers. One of the things that we have been doing since 1845 is preserving the worthwhile past by preserving the research work of genealogists like yourself that maybe never got around to publishing it. Many times families will turn over boxes upon boxes of paper and notes and correspondence and files, sometimes on CD or sometimes on thumb drives, that their loved ones had compiled, their parents. And maybe they're not interested in genealogy. That's why we have over 28.4, uh, 
28 million manuscripts available to our members because of the amount of collections that we have gathered since 1845. And it's not just genealogist notes, it's original records, it's diaries, it's journals, it's captured British military records that were found in homes in Boston after the siege of Boston and when they left in 1776. We have such a large amount of treasure, it would take a lifetime, and even for myself, I've been on staff for 31 years and been a member for nearly 40. Uh, I haven't scratched the surface on all of the treasures in our manuscript collection or even all of our books. So we're gonna talk now about online record collections that we have and uh, give you a little bit more deeper dive into that. So in our collections, our overview to what we generally have available would be broken down easily by describing it. So we have vital records. So those are birth, marriages, and deaths. We have church records and also records for synagogues as well and cemetery records. So gravestone transcriptions, photographs of gravestones. We have various court land and probate records. In fact, we've partnered with the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts to help digitize the earliest of all the probate records for Massachusetts. You'll find many of the early probates for um, towns in Massachusetts available for you to look at right on our website. Census records, tax and voter lists, military records, societies such as the Massachusetts um, Ancient and Free Accepted Masons Masonic database dating back to 1733 with details on all of the members town records, genealogies and biographies, and local histories. Um, in many cases, our ancestors don't have a published genealogy book. Now, that's not saying that I don't want you to write one, but sometimes the story of our ancestor lays hidden in the local history and county history books that talk about the early families or families in general in that community. Atlases and maps are great. How great would it be to open up an atlas and find that little dot saying your ancestor's name? and then taking a family trip and finding out that that house from 1795 is still standing in Vermont. Immigration records are also a very popular uh, avenue to proceed. It may be from the Great Migration from 1620 to 1640, or something that is a little later, right into the 19th and 20th century. Our immigration records databases may help you. Our journals and periodicals, like I said before, the span of vast array of topics in parts of the globe. Diaries and transcripts, diaries, what a hidden gem. If you think about it yourself, even if you're a journal or a diary keeper, think about the people you've mentioned over the years in your own journal. <laughs> Maybe good, might be bad, but how about now looking for your ancestors? I want you to look at our diaries and transcripts for those in journals with the idea that, well, don't just look for your family name, Look for the town they're living in. See if that diary, the analytics will tell you if that diary has a coverage of the community your ancestor lived in. And then find that diary and see if they talk about your family. Hopefully it's good news. And of course, there's also various study projects such as the Great uh, Migration Project that's been worked on with by Robert Charles Anderson and now Nathan Murphy since 1988 covering thousands upon thousands of our immigrants that came to New England uh, since 1620 through 1640 in our early New England Families Project, which will proceed to go forward from 1641 to 1700. New England material is amazing. And one of the things that are available is 17th century resources, especially the Mayflower, a very popular for the 51 uh, survivors of the first winter in Plymouth, the, you have over 35 million living descendants, it is estimated now. So chances are some of the 1,000 people in this audience are probably descended from Mayflower passengers. But even if you're not, our materials don't care if you came over in 1620, if your ancestors came to this nation thousands of years before with Native American resources, or if your ancestors just arrived last month. So study projects such as the Great Migration and Early Vermont Records are also a great uh, resource. And the Early Vermont Records are looking at the earliest families that settled in Northwestern New England and all of the variety of records that we're transcribing and putting together that pull these databases and study projects together. So you can see where we're getting the material, not just seeing a footnote. 17th century resources. One of the greatest 
compilations was done by a man, man by the name of Clarence Allman Torrey, born a century to the year I was born, and he lived until his 90s. And during that course of time, uh, Torrey, who was not employed by any HGS, but he did this as his own project to record all marriages that occurred in New England prior to December 31st, 1700. So essentially catching all of the earliest marriages. And this includes people that were married in England. And it doesn't mean that a marriage date and place is known. It means that it was speculated that they had been married by a certain time. Maybe there's a child being born or the death of a wife is recorded. Looking through the Tories New England marriages, which is available on American ancestors, is a quick way of looking at some of the earliest families in New England. Researching Mayflower ancestry is very easily. On the top of our website, you can see signature projects and you can go to Beyond Mayflower 2020. The commemoration of the Mayflower in 2020 brought about a variety of different databases on American ancestors, and a lot of times in collaboration with the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. Some of the things that we have on there include thousands of applications from the members that were born up until 1920. So the earliest members uh, since 1897 through those born January 1st, 1920 are available digitally online. Why might that be of interest? Maybe your great uncle was a member or a distant cousin, or maybe someone who is a very distant cousin, but has proven aligned to the Mayflower, so you can just piggyback into their research. Now, some of the old applications don't have as great of citations or not all of the details you might need, and you might have to do a little brush up on that, but it is laying the groundwork so you can find your own or confirm your own Mayflower line. Another thing are the Massachusetts Federal Records that we have online, known as the official series or the TAN books. We have many of these published volumes covering from uh, 1620 right down to 1850. And those are available again on American ancestors. We also have Plymouth County probate records and Mayflower families in the fifth generation. Now, if you've done Mayflower research, you're probably very familiar with the silver books, not to be confused with the tan books I just mentioned for vital records, but the silver books and the pink books, which are the ones that are in progress, are the work of the General Society of Mayflower Descendants to capture the first five generations of the immigrant right down to practically his great-great-grandchildren or her great-great-grandchildren. The material itself is tremendous. Now these books are being sold by the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, so they're not gonna put the books online. They're still very popular. However, we have worked to include the fifth generation, sort of like the low hanging fruit, because you know if you connect to the fifth generation, the generations preceding that are already tied in, are in a considered very reliable research, and will also echo you into the fact that you can now join the Mayflower Society. It's a matter of connecting generation six to yourself, of course. And American ancestors offer the tools and the resources or the assistance to help you get there. So here's an example from the Mayflower membership applications. In this case, this is somebody born in 1871 in Albion, Edwards County, Illinois. And they applied for a May Mayflower membership, but it's not just them. If you notice on the right, their spouse, Everett Francis Harris is listed, as well as all of the people from the Mayflower, so say John Alden, all the way down to the living person who has the application. In this case, Emma's descendant from William Brewster. Let me talk some about, more about some of our study projects we have in American Ancestors. The Great Migration Study Project, which I'll be lecturing about at Roots Tech uh, coming next week, uh, talks about the wonderful work done by Robert Charles Anderson, a fellow of the American Society of Genealogists who started this project back in 1988. The first three volumes of the Great Migration, covering all immigrants to New England, 1620 to 35, were published in three volumes. In the years to follow, the volumes from 16, 34 to 35 were published in seven volumes. So in complete, 1620 to 33, the first three volumes, and 34 to 35 continued the next. And I'm pleased to announce through the work of Ian Watson, uh, that we now have the first volume in Great Migration Study Project, 1636 to 1638. Now, 
we are going to continue this project with the great work of Nathan Murphy and look forward to other volumes. But the first volume is out that covers the uh, letters A through BE. Uh, so if your last name is say Betts or something like that, will fit in perfectly into that scope. Now the genealogical and biographical sketches in the Great Migration Study Project are very detailed. It's going to give you the information on the immigrant and their immediate family. And again, what we're also including in the Great Migration is all of the primary sources that connect your ancestor back to their Great Migration ancestor uh, for that generation. So you're going to get links to baptism records uh, that will tell you where the source is, um, vital records, probate, uh, all of things have been investigated and applied in these sketches. Let me show you. And again, this is on American ancestors. Here's the pages uh, from the series that cover Thomas Hooker. Uh, he arrived in 1633 on the Griffin and settled in Cambridge and later went to Hartford, Connecticut by 1636. He was a minister. And this gives you about his church membership, when he became a freeman, his education, offices and estates that he held, as well as getting down to information about his birth and death on the lower part of the page. This will continue on with information about their children. Now, not everybody who intended to come over to New England um, survived, or for that matter, even show up in records. An example right before Thomas Hooker, John Hook, who came on the Mayflower as a servant boy to Isaac Allerton and, quote, died within the first winter. And that's from Brad, William Bradford's journal. Other projects that we're working on include the early New England families, essentially taking what Clarence Allman Torrey did for the marriages prior to 1700. This is covering the families from 1641 to 1700. And this is a enormous project, just like all the things in the Great Migration and beyond. It is taking the utmost care to document and gather all the details that we can provide to you. It's being arranged by the year of marriage. So 1641 and 42, you'll already find a couple of volumes already produced for this. And any new sketches are on American ancestors. Western families in 1790 was the work of my late colleague and dear friend, Helen Ullman, uh, who is a fellow of the American Society of Genealogists. Her work covered submissions from people like yourself of their ancestors that appeared on the 1790 Massachusetts census from Western Mass. And these sketches were documented and um, evaluated and included in this great series. And, but we haven't stopped with the work on gathering early settlers because early settlers Vermont by Scott Andrew Bartley will cover county by county all the settlers in Vermont through the year 1771 records. Well, I've mentioned there are so many different records on American ancestors, but they're not just the records dealing with the 1600s and uh, early 1700s. We had a collaboration with the Boston Arch Catholic Archdiocese where we've put a database together of records from 1789 to 1920. Before that, these records were not microfilmed or were not online and were very limited access. Now we were pleased to be able to share with these with this collaboration. As you can see on the right, I just do a drop down of a variety of different churches. But again, I can go back to my search. I can put in a first and last name. I can pick a baptism, a confirmation, maybe a marriage or a burial. I could pick the location or select the volume that I want to be limited to say every O'Sullivan that happened to be in uh, Milton, Massachusetts. And then I can search the records. The nice thing about this collection, history is not in black and white. These records are in color. We've done the utmost care to scan at high resolution so you can zoom right in and see if those T's are crossed and those I's are dotted and clearly find the name of your Irish immigrant and maybe a clue as to where they came from or that middle name of your Italian immigrant or Polish ancestor to find out their name before they Americanized it. These are great resources and we're just so pleased to have it. This happens to be from the Blessed Sacrament Church in Jamaica Plain from 1906. Probate records. Probate records are really one of the sources of being able to peel back the pages of time. If you know your ancestor died, did he or she leave a probate? Is there a guardianship for their children because the parents died young? Were they committed into an institution because of mental health?
There's a variety of different probate records available, and we offer these online in American Ancestors, and they're not just limited to Massachusetts. But let me show you our Massachusetts collection. And this one right here is a probate from Suffolk County, where you're actually looking at the original record book copy. In some cases, we even have the file papers for many of these. So you're getting both the last will and testament, where the person leaves to their spouse and their children or grandchildren, certain items, may it be land, et cetera. Or there's also the inventories. These inventories herald everything that they have from pots and pans, cows and chickens, and unfortunately, also sometimes you'll find human property. The enslaved of America are detailed in these probate records. This is part of our efforts of 10 million names to identify and connect the descendants with these early ancestors. Beyond New England, we have a variety of records like I mentioned before for New York. I limited the amount of databases we have to 31, but again, our resources and manuscripts and books just scratch the surface. But you can find things, again, outside of New England, because we're more than that, we're American ancestors. Our journals include a variety of the leading publications in the field, uh, the American Genealogist, the Mayflower Descendant, the Pennsylvania Genealogical Magazine, the Connecticut Nutmegger, and the Virginia Genealogist are just some of the journals besides our own beloved New England Historical and Genealogical Register, which we've published quarterly since 1847. Our Ascension Roadmap will now take you onto our digital library and talk a little bit more about that. So our digital library, at a quick glance, we have digitized material from three repositories at NEHS. That includes the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center, the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections, and our own research library. There are over 780,000 images currently in over 32 digital library archive collections online. Now, it's definitely not the 28 million that we have, but we're working at it. The DLA collection may be one of our large archival collections or several archival collections of books or shared different themes and topics. They can be original letters as well as published material. Uh, the published and unpublished material, letters, photographs, newspapers, genealogies, cities, directories, and business records are a variety of things that are available to you on our DLA as a member of American Ancestors. Getting to the digital library is very easy. Under search, it's the second to last option, a digital library and archive. Clicking there will bring you to this page where you can search the digital library and archive, or you can simply browse into the collections by clicking on a particular one below of the three I mentioned. You can then within the collection itself, search for a particular name uh, or category or location, or you may find a repository collection that interests you. By clicking on that, you can be able to search, find out any finding guides or further information. The Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center has over 17 DLA collections. And this includes a variety of family papers, social services organizations, uh, the, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society of Boston, the port records, these are aid societies set up for uh, Jewish immigrants who came into Boston, uh, Jewish communities of the North Shore, the Jewish Times collection, uh, rabbinical uh, education papers, and so much more. Again, if you have Jewish heritage, hopefully our Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center can help you uncover some of your past. Again, our repository collections can be searched on a variety of different ways, including business records and account books, church records. How about our vast collection of Civil War manuscripts? Many of our earliest members were actually officers and soldiers in the Civil War. In fact, our first honorary member was the President John Quincy Adams, who accepted his membership, and we have his letter of acceptance in our archives. Manuscript collections of the 28 million records include family registers and Bible records. These are all handwritten and typed records. So if you had an old family Bible um, that you had, people would submit transcriptions and sometimes they will send the original Bibles in. 
we have thousands upon thousands of old Bible records that you can search already on American ancestors. And we're even going further to digitally image all the pages and make those accessible as well. Church records, we have original church records from Boston and throughout the Northeast, copies of the records or journals from the minister themselves. Family history manuscripts are our probably most uh, vastly collected um, option that we have in our manuscripts. And these include those handwritten and typed genealogy and research notes. The great intention was to publish a book, but again, like I said earlier, they sometimes end up after the person dies with no place to go. American Ancestors, our archives has been the home for many of these such collections over the years, and we continue to collect and preserve this history. You can uh, also go into finding our research library collections and search things such as our city directories we have available or family history books or local history books. That's right. You don't have to be in our building on Newbury Street to do some of your research. There are many of these options that we're making digital so you can get them right from home. City directories, well, we have over 120 of them, and it's not just Massachusetts, and it's not just New England. We include New York, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and a variety of other states. These have great images, including advertisements, maps, as well as the details that show our ancestors moving from place to place or the jobs that change. In fact, some city directories even record the passing of an individual a year later in the city directory, or the fact that they were moved to another city, state, or um, might be right down the street. Genealogies and local histories. We have currently over 400 volumes online, and most of them are not available anywhere else online. Our local history books are also a variety of both published material and its focus on variety of different locations. May it be right downtown of Boston, Massachusetts, or maybe as far away as Seattle, Washington, or down in Mexico. Our local history spans US and Canada and as well as Europe and abroad. Summary, we have a great collection that I hope that you have got a little bit of a taste of what American Ancestors is all about. And we're happy to partner with GEDmatch in this collaboration, which Tom will talk more about in just a few moments. We have these robust websites, pages, and databases for you to search. We have education materials, as I say, that you can download and use. We have a variety of different genealogical tools to assist you. We have the education offerings from videos and templates, courses, and again, I mentioned research tours, and our digital library with unique material allows you to do research right from home, even if it's at three o'clock in the morning. I know you're out there because I do it as well. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much on behalf of American Ancestors uh, and our education department uh, and the rest of NEHGS and American Ancestors. We thank you for your continued membership and support and welcome you to join us on AmericanAncestors.org. Thank you. All right, David. Wow, uh, I'm, I'm gonna put my, my uh, webcam back on. There we go. Don't mind mine as well. I, I, I'm blown away. Uh, and there is just so much to what you guys offer that um, I, I knew it was a lot, but really having you walk through all of those resources is, is just incredible uh, what you guys offer. So um, again, I think it's it's really a, a really great partnership that we have but where we can collaborate like this. Um, Judd mentioned American Ancestors, and you you mentioned that we do have um, this partnership, and so I do want to share with everyone that. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen real quick, because if you are a GEDmatch member, um, we actually have a partnership. Tom, just so you know, you went mute. do these things, these webinars, there's, there's, there could be little technical things that happen. 
And and I, I just ran into one where it's not going to let me share my screen for some security reason. Um, but what I can do, yeah, it's not going to not going to work. If you're a Judmatch member, log into your Judmatch account, and then you can view and edit your profile. Uh, there's a, a a nice big button right there that says View Edit right on the main Judmatch dashboard. Where you can then see your profile, there's a number of different tabs. And we have a tab called Partner Benefits. And on that tab, we detail how you can get a $25 off American Ancestors membership. If you're a tier one member, uh, so you do need to be a tier one member uh, to get that, uh, that discount. Uh, so if you're a tier one member of GenMatch, you can uh, get that American Ancestors discount and save $25. The regular price is $99.95, so it'll drop to, I think, around $75 or $74.95. And that discount is applied at the checkout um, on the American Ancestors website. So uh, we, we do offer that benefit for our Tier 1 members. And um, and so if you aren't a Tier 1 member, you're always welcome to join American Ancestors or use all the, the great free resources that they have. Uh, but I did want to let you guys know that that's uh, an offering that they've uh, given to us for our Tier 1 members. Okay, David, questions? poured in as you went through all these great resources available. Uh, I was going through them all and, and I mean, there's there's easily 50 questions. Um, so some of them are around uh, the databases and the ones that you guys have. And a number of questions that came up was, um, how does how do the databases compare to, you know, maybe Ancestry and, and their databases? Um, we had a couple of people ask that. You know, sure. do you guys collaborate with Ancestry on any of the databases? How, how many of them are unique to you guys? Maybe you can speak to that for a moment. Sure. I mean, we do collaborations so that you'll find some overlap with Ancestry, with American Ancestors, but we have so much of our, our own unique collections. So one of the things I, I say is you could sign up as a guest member on American Ancestors and pull up the list of all of our databases, then pull up a catalog search with Ancestry. Now we don't have them all tiered mm -hmm. saying what's on Ancestry, what's on Fold3 and um, whatnot, or what's on Family Search. But you can probably evaluate very quickly when you do a search by location or region that, oh wait, I haven't found that on Ancestry before. Or mm -hmm. it's from our manuscript collection, chances are we haven't shared it and it's only available for our members through our website. We do also do collaboration. So there are things that we have that we worked and shared with others. For instance, our Masonic database. Uh, you'll find that on Ancestry, but it was through a partnership. Um, but we're the uh, the primary uh, caretaker of those records. But um, yeah, it, it's a very good question. I, I couldn't break down all 400 plus databases. It's a lot, right? Yeah, which yeah. ones that we have that Ancestry don't. But I would say if you pull up both both screens side by side and do a catalog search and kind of see if or if it's something that just strikes your fancy that it, I don't remember seeing that before, that might be a clear, clear indicator that it's unique to us. That's good. All right. And what about family search? That was another one, you know, that they've got a lot of data, a lot of records. Oh, absolutely. And um, some um, similar kind of answer there that they, you know, that they might, you guys have some maybe shared data, but they might have something unique. You guys might have some things that are unique as well. Correct. And one of the things that we've worked over the years is great partnership with Family Search, uh, and where we've collaborated uh, on both transcribing records, is digitization of our records, getting digitization of their records available for our members as well. So again, because we do so much collaboration, hence with GEDmatch, uh, we try to allow our resources to be shared by other organizations. And then we mm -hmm. have some things that are very unique to us. I mean, especially things in our DLA, our Digital Library Archive with over 780,000 images. That That's really just on American ancestors. For the most yeah. Part. Wow. Again, so many, so many resources. Um, I, as you were going through it, I was thinking, okay, I got to start looking at some of my own uh, family history to see what you guys might have there. We've got some specific questions now. If you don't mind, sure. we can get into some of those uh, around. I'm glad to have whatever time you have for questions. Yeah. I have the same amount of time. All right, so here's what we're gonna do then. We've got, um, I mean, it's 10.50 my time on the Pacific uh, Coast time. So let's go to about 11.30 if that works for you. Sure. At the most, all right, we'll, we'll see what we can get through. Cause I, again, a lot of great questions here and I think it could really help people out. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so this is someone who said, that, uh, Nathan, his records state that his father might be a direct descendant of an ancestor who was a Mayflower passenger. Could a mitochondrial DNA sample be su sufficient to obtain proof 
via DNA, DNA analysis that he is a descendant of that ancestor. Well, the, the problem with mitochondrial DNA is that the surname is going to change every generation. So analysis is, would you have a mitochondrial DNA that goes back to daughter, 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 say from Priscilla Mullins Alden, then maybe it could be useful. However, the one thing with mitochondrial is, again, the surnames are gonna change. The other thing you have to take in mind is that you could be descendant from a first cousin of Priscilla Mullins that has the same mitochondrial DNA that stayed in England that never came over to America. That could be your, so the application would not be solely based on that. DNA is being used. I mean, obviously, why DNA? Because of the direct male paternity and surnames being pretty much the same is more of your stronger suit for applying to a hereditary organization, such as the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. I'm the state historian for the Massachusetts Sons of the American Revolution, and I'm on the genealogy committee. And the same thing is true with, and just to kind of sidestep a bit, um, mm -hmm. when you have an application for someone in the Revolutionary War, and your last name is Trowbridge, and you're trying to connect back to your ancestor. Well, great, it shows that you're Trowbridge, but are you descended from the soldier's Y DNA, or his kid brother who was a year old at Lexington and mm -hmm. Concord in 1775, that could easily have never had served in the war, but you're descended from him. So it's you have to use it in conjunction with traditional research, or to back up as sort of a proof argument. Got it. But why why the why uh, DNA test would be a better yeah, option. It would be a much better bio. option. Yeah. Autosomal yeah. to connect back. Um, Autosomal, obviously. Gonna be, yeah, it's going to be tough because by the time of, you know, the, your fifth great grandparents, there are no living individuals that I know of that descend from a Mayflower passenger since most of them are between ninth and twelfth and even higher great grandparents. So the autosomal is a little gone, but it could be used in conjunction. I've seen some creative arguments. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Here's someone who says that they, uh, so Barbara, she says, I have Danish ancestors who lived in and started families in the Virgin Islands. Much of the documentation is in Danish. Mm -hmm. Do you guys do translations uh, into other languages? If she Absolutely. has the documents. Yeah. Okay. Our, our research services team um, has a variety of individuals on a global level that we partner with to work on anything. So it you know, it'd be Danish, it'd be German, it'd be French, Italian. Uh, we can find someone on our team because uh, we have a suite of contract researchers as well mm. that may not be physically in our building, but they're in our virtual Rolodex, if you will, that mm -hmm. we turn to and hire out to do projects like that. We've had um, a variety of Swiss, Swedish, um, everything. So yeah, Danish won't be a problem. And that would be our research services department for that. Research services. Okay, excellent. All right, Rhode Island in the 1600s. Uh, Nathan asks, how much do you have in resources for someone who lived in Rhode Island in the 1600s? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, for Rhode Island, obviously, it's one of the New England states. So we've been collecting things mm -hmm. from Rhode Island since 1845, even before we started expanding outside of the New England focus in the early part of the 20th century. Um, one of the ones right off I could think of would be the Arnold's Vital Records. Uh, James Arnold was a historian and genealogist that went around town by town in Rhode Island and copied out the old vital records. So from 1636 all the way down to just about 1850 in those volumes you can find on American ancestors. And again, uh, Nathan, what I would suggest is go into our database search and just put in Rhode Island. You'll find a variety of different things uh, that you may not find anywhere else uh, available online. All right. All right, Robert has a question. He needs help uh, with the Irish who were from French Canada and then moved to New York State. Where where should he go to try to find some records from for that that group? Sure. And and I'm just going to add, Tom, that I might give suggestions that don't have to necessarily be in the focus of American ancestors. Uh, sure. That might yeah, be yeah, yeah. Of course. Question. So I have Irish immigrants to Canada as well. One of the biggest problems is the lack of passenger lists that catch the early Irish, especially even during the famine, into uh, maybe Atlantic Canada or even French Canada into Quebec or Ontario further on. Um, so one of the things you would be looking for is a naturalization record once they get to America, because that might tell you the county or where they're from. Now, if they stayed in Canada for a while, you may even find land grants. Now, my particular 
one of my Irish ancestors I could think of is uh, John Kelly. Uh, not exactly helpful to look for John Kelly, but in Albert County, New Brunswick, he got a Crown land grant. And these Crown land grants you can find on Family Search and Library and Archives Canada. Where on his grant, he says, I am a native of this part of Ireland. And so it told me he was from Tipperary. It didn't give me the exact village or townland, which I would have preferred, but it said <laughs> he arrived in December of 1816. And of course, when I first found this, I'm like, great, I'll find the passenger list, if there actually was a passenger list from December of 1816 that survived. <laughs> so I would say, look at American records first and backtrack it. I mean, obviously there's a variety of different places such as Family Search and uh, Ancestry that you can find. Um, particular censuses online, such as the Canadian census, depending if they're on the decennial census. Um, for most of Canada, there, there are censuses since 1871, and this is my plug to say I'm giving a talk on Canadian censuses for Roots Tech. So next week, if you happen to be going, Nathan, um, that's one, one of my options. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be what I would try. I would try naturalization records in America, as well as another collection. Um, again, this is going to be Family Search and Ancestry called the St. Albans Border Crossing. Now, St. Albans is in Vermont, but the entire border of America and Canada since 1895, when you cross the border, it was recorded in some way. When my grandparents came down from New Brunswick in 1923 into Boston, they didn't go by land, they went by a vessel, but it's recorded in the St. Albans collection. And it will give you the dates they arrived, their age, how much money they had. So if you're Americanized, Canadian, formerly Irish ancestors came over a little <laughs> late. You might catch them in that too. Interesting. That's good. All right. Mary is trying to figure out when her ancestors entered the colonies. That's her brick wall. Mm -hmm. um, his ancestor was born in 1762. He's tried to look at old records. His name was somewhat common. His name is Edward Crawford. So oh. it pops up in several states. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he was born here or if he came here as a child. Don't know anything about his parents when he got married. What advice would you have for Mary? Sure. Well, I mean, Mary, what's going to limit you is the surviving passenger lists that occur in the colony that the, he came to. Uh, naturalization records start in the 1790s. So if he became a naturalized citizen of whatever state it was that he was residing in. If he lived after, say, early 1790s, you may find a naturalization that might say he's a native of. The biggest problem that I find, and especially just in New England, Tom, is that we have these great resources from the 17th century because mm -hmm. we're coming over. But by the 18th century, there's a lot of vessels, and we know they arrived because, well, we have ancestors that are here. But the passenger list for America really don't start until about 1820 where you start to see the Atlantic ports recording all the vessels coming in. Before that, it's catch as catch can. You might find a mention of a ship coming in in the newspaper that doesn't say all the 200 passengers on it or 100 passengers. Um, so your naturalization is going to be your best clue as to the where and when. But there's also mm -hmm. another clue, and not to excuse DNA. If you can find a Crawford with a Y DNA, and then you do like I've done with my Lamberts in Ireland, I find a match in Ireland that has the same haplogroup and the same mm. good amount of SNPs, single nuclear polymorphism, mm -hmm. and numbers that match, then you mm -hmm. might have found someone who's geographically still in England or Ireland or wherever your family came from. And genetically, you may do that. Again, you're going to need a male Crawford and do a test. Maybe somebody in Europe, or if you have a speculation as where they may have came from, Buy a test for the holidays for some person over in Europe because most Europeans don't do DNA. And, and it, the reason I find this is that a lot of them are still living within 100 miles. They know, they've lived for a thousand years. So they, they know their ancestors. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't need yeah. to know where they came from. So yeah. Americans and Canadians that are trying to find out, leap across the Atlantic to get to wherever in Europe or elsewhere your ancestors came from are doing the tests. It's a matter of being generous to say, well, split the cost or you get a good sale on a test. Mm -hmm. and do it. But that, that would be what I would suggest. That's great advice. And autosomal may come in handy. I mean, and Jed Match would be a no-brainer. 
to oh, absolutely. tie that in. Yeah, because I mean, it goes back to your, I mean, autosomal is roughly, Tom, I and mean, you please correct me on this because you're more of the expert in this. Roughly your fifth great grandparents. I mean, of course, within dog, I mean, it could be, you know, further back. But you, so if this ancestor, 1760s is probably a third or fourth great grandparent, you probably have his autosomal DNA. The question is, yeah. is his brother's autosomal DNA with someone that's over in Europe that's tested and it's on GEDmatch? You need to find mm -hmm. out. There you go. All right, Pat uh, said that they notice Quebec genealogy. What mm -hmm. about other Canadian provinces, uh, such as the in, you know the East Coast? Uh, she, they have some ancestors from Eastern Canada, um, and some of them went to New England. So, mm -hmm. what kind of resources could you recommend there? Oh, sure. I mean, so I have most of the Atlantic Canadian provinces, except for Prince Edward Island. I have ancestors from. So, with our resources at American Ancestors, um, what we don't have online. We have a vast collection of books and manuscripts. Um, one, for instance, um, in New give you an example for Atlantic Canada, um, Nova Scotia, originally an Acadian settlement, settled by New Englanders, and those were called planters. Now, essentially, the expelled, expulsed uh, Acadians that went on to places like uh, Louisiana or into Quebec or even in some cases back to France, their land was seized by the British Crown and offered to New Englanders. So these New England planters would go up there. Now, about a decade and a half later, a little thing called the American Revolutionary War happened. And if you were loyal to King George and not the efforts of the rebels in your community, you became a loyalist. And many Atlantic Canadians mm -hmm. went up to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Ontario, et cetera. So you have the immigration there. So a database that we have called New Englanders in Nova Scotia by a Fred Crowell done in the early 20th century, details all of these families. So if you have someone that, you know, what's it, why is this Bradford family from Cape Cod living in Nova Scotia? And I know, cause that's where my Bradfords are from, but are we related? Sure, cause that Bradford family became a loyalist and went up to Nova Scotia and it's all detailed. So in a lot of cases, there are collections for Atlantic Canada to name just one part of Canada that have been already pulled together. Um, and then another example for Atlantic Canada, um, these are books that are not online, is the work of Stephen White from the University of De Moncton uh, has done all these early Acadian families, including French neutrals, which were um, those that came down to New England and were supported that were basically, you know, families that some cases even stayed and some went back. Um, so there's a variety. I mean, one of the biggest resources that you can get for Probates and deeds for Canada or vital records is right on familysearch.org. Uh, again, another partner organization that's done tremendous work. Awesome. Okay, resources for people whose ancestors came through Virginia. Uh, Sandra is asking about that. You know, obviously there's a lot of data for the North Northeast, but how much is available for Virginia and anything south of that? I think someone asked as well for uh, uh, you know the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, what, what do you guys have there? Or you in, in, in Maine? Maine's already, you guys already cover Maine pretty well, right? But oh, yeah. Virginia yeah. Through yeah, I can, I can touch base on the middle colonies in Southern. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, the Virginia Genealogist, which is a really uh, well respected piece of scholarship, that's available on American ancestors. But then you also have those external databases I had mentioned before. In America, we've had newspapers since 1704. Remember that thing that we used to read before it became on our phone? <laughs> <laughs> so we have access to early American newspapers and it covers wow. all the states and all the colonies from the early part of the 18th century, right down, I think series one goes roughly to the 1830s. So you can find, you know, your ancestor was an apprentice to someone. There's a runaway ad because he ran away from his shopkeeper. He was supposed to be learning a trade from that he was signed up for a few years. Or if you have, and you know an African American ancestor who was enslaved, you might find, you know, details in a runaway ad for that person, or mm. find the obituary uh, in a listing of the inventory of the human property that is published in the paper, and maybe that mm. name, first name, catches a thread because you found them on the 1870 census. Um, there's a variety of um, records and newspapers alone. Again, harking back to when we open our doors. Uh, on Newbury Street again, we have a tremendous collection. Um, uh, Person Persons is a book on the earliest 
families in Virginia. And that, that book is really wonderful in the early 17th century, those that came over in Jamestown and shortly thereafter into the 17th century. But there's just so much. I mean, I would say, um, you know, sign up as a guest member to start with, mm -hmm. go to our database, see what databases we have that, you know, run a list of the names, but also search by location. And also go into our catalog and see what books and resources we have. We also, one of the other uh, benefits I didn't uh, mention, because there's so many to offer, uh, we offer a photocopy service. So you can pay for mm. photocopies being a member or non-member that we'll go in and we'll copy pages or pages, uh, a page or a page, variety of pages from an entire book not the whole book because there's copyright to right <laughs> but we'll yeah. do that in our same thing wow. as our manuscript collection we have so many things that you can re uh access from home just by looking at our catalog seeing what we have and then inquiring yeah. how do we resource it and the other thing if you're ever stuck and i know that we only have a certain amount of time today we have that free ask a genealogist service monday through friday Nine, Monday through Saturday, nine to five. And you can just go right in there and ask a question, so. That's great. Now, you mentioned reopening your, your location uh, in Newbury, Newbury Street, right? Uh, we had a number of people ask, when is that happening? I think they, some people might have missed that. So they, I think they're I anxious to get I into could, this. Yeah, I wish I could give you the crystal ball answer. Um, I can tell yeah. you that I know that I am going to be working from home for, next, uh, for the next few months. Um, Originally, there was talk of staff going back in February. Well, obviously, I'm working from home, as you can yep. see. Um, the library, once the construction is done, and because it's not just construction of the other building, I'll give you a little insight. We're putting fire suppression. So all the ceilings are ripped out of the entire building mm -hmm. that you've probably been to before. And we're having that put in to protect our collection. And we're connecting with a new elevator, connecting the two buildings. So it's not just build a new building and knock a hole through the wall. It's a little bit more involved than that. So yeah, yeah. Um, I would say look at AmericanAncestors.org for updates. I'm sure once people catch it, it's going to hit social media. I know it's going to be on the front page of my Twitter account <laughs> as soon as we know. And maybe I'll post a live video from work going in the building. Um, there you go. But I would say, again, I, I, I hate to give any speculation, but I'd say towards the end of the year um, is yeah, going to probably yeah. be more, most likely. Okay. All right. Good. Um, another question around uh, two parts of this question. One is records from the U.S. territories, like Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second part of that question is slavery there as well as in the mainland U.S. What kind of records for U.S. territories and then slavery there and in the U.S.? Okay. For the territories itself, I mean, obviously, we would rely on some of our external databases for that. Okay. Again, look at our collections because, again, it may not be finding the record for where they had come from and what resources that are there that we might have. It might be after they have arrived in America and mm -hmm. seeing that, that state that they're living in. Um, as far as enslaved, um, 10 million names. Our uh, new mm. project as of last year that we launched um, wow. is an amazing undertaking with many, many individuals and scholars being involved to look at all aspects of records before the Emancipation Proclamation, to bring the stories to life, to find that one name in an inventory or a runaway ad, or in a personal diary, we're reaching out to people that have family papers that are hmm. from the days of enslavement, that wow. it's not in an archive, it's not in a courthouse, it's, it's at home. They have yeah. a family Bible that recorded the enslaved, and a, I mean, how amazing is that? Think of the trickle down, Tom, of oh, something yeah. from 150 to 200 years ago that mm. you have that has a direct effect on thousands of individuals. So that's what we're seeking. And in fact, we've got many collections already given to us at American Ancestors because mm. our archives are suitable for such things. Um, so that we started off with the uh, with Richard Cellini's efforts with a project called GU272. And that's Georgetown University. That's a 272 enslaved individuals that were sold by the Jesuits of Georgetown University down to two mm. uh, plantations in the South and tracking down their stories, connecting their descendants. So we really tested the water with this. And again, Richard mm -hmm. Cellini at the, you know, the head of the whole idea of 10 million names, this has been in, really embraced. And again, we'll be launching a partnership um, which is already known about, so this is no breaking news, 
uh, mm -hmm. um, on the main stage uh, at Roots Tech and more to find out. And you can go to American Ancestors to find out more about it. So we want to know about your story. And then we're going to find those records that will hopefully connect you to your ancestors. And we'll meet wow. some in the middle. So that's what our hope is for that. Well, that's great. There was a number of questions that came in around that. So I think the, the, the takeaway is reach out to you guys, right, with their story and then Absolutely. to see how you can work together to find those answers if possible for okay. um, for those folks who are, are looking for their, their details and their ancestors. And that's awesome. Looking forward to, you know, hearing more from Roots Tech on that. Yeah, it's going to be great. All right. Uh, Quaker Records. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you guys have a few of those. Maybe? We do. We do. Uh, yeah. A yeah. combination of microfilm, manuscript, book, uh, and again, some of our databases, you're going to find articles and journals like our New England Historical and Genealogical Register. Um, any journals that had a populace that dealt with Quaker, you'll find diaries. You'll see Quaker records are just amazing because they mm -hmm. really delve into sort of the whole social story of the family. So if, if your ancestor did something wrong, it's written in the Quaker minutes pretty extensively. Um, and the idea of, you know, Quaker cemeteries that had gravestones, we have gravestone transcriptions mm -hmm. and things like, you know, millions of inscriptions of different stones. So that could help you out as well. Uh, and again, um, lectures, we've had lectures on Quaker records. Uh, you can find our educational portal and maybe a program that we've done or a finding guide that we offer that may help you with that. And again, our Ask a Genealogist portal to ask anything specific, or if you, again, not, not just to, to plug our consultations, but you could always do a paid consultation with one of us and we can delve into it. And again, we're not just limited to the focus of what American ancestors can offer you. Many of the consultations I do will deal with family search, ca Canadian archives, European archives, mm. whatever we can get to online with you and share or give you the steps and the tools that we've learned from years of doing this to where you'll find those records. Again, it isn't just all arrows point to Boston to American ancestors. Awesome. Oh, that's great. All right, so many questions here. Uh, so here, here's an interesting one, and it's actually timely. And um, so this is from Carol, and she says, I assume you're aware that the British Ministry of Justice is proposing to destroy thousands of original documents, such as will and associated documents. Mm -hmm. Any advice for those of us who want to protest the decision? And apparently the deadline is tomorrow. Is that something right. that you've heard about? I have, in fact, yeah. I've actually tweeted about it on my social media. Um, the the problem that I found, the petition, again, these are probates from 1855 forward. These aren't the old ones that are acute. These are the more recent ones, I understand. Again, I could be wrong. This is what social media has told me. Mm -hmm. I tried to sign the petition, Tom, but I'm not a resident of the UK. So, uh, so you can be a resident of the UK. That is an American. Like my grandfather's from England, so this affects my ancestors' records as well. My family only came over yeah. in 1911 to Canada, then to the United States from England. So how can I benefit to help this? Social media. Spread the word. Your local genealogical organizations. Word of mouth at your genealogical, you know, phone conversation you have with a couple of other genealogists. They have social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Just get the word out. Get the link. I mean, you've probably already seen it if you know what it, you know, the deadline has come up. And just post it and get it out there and anchor it to your page for the next 24 hours or more. And just to let people know. I mean, I think it's a, it's wonderful to digitize records, but not to yeah. get rid of them. But I just, yeah. I mean, it, this is no slam against the United States government, but you know that most of the early, not the earliest, but the later censuses that the United States have are not in the archives anymore. Once they were microfilmed, they were destroyed. Uh, I wow. mean, so we don't, you know, you'd like to say, oh, I want to see that color version of it. Well, it doesn't exist anymore. I mean, and think of mm -hmm. how many records were lost by fire, like the fire in St. Louis, oh, yeah. Missouri in 73, all the personnel records for the Army from 1912 to 73, and the Army Air Corps and the Air Force. I, th those are gone. The 1890 census. So those are done by accidental fires. The mm -hmm. idea of destroying these records, I would almost think, even though the UK is 
a lot smaller than Texas in most cases, uh, you could probably um, find some place that would take them or some place that would house them. There's got to be yeah, right. some place they can build to hold this. I, I hope that this is an effort that they continue to preserve it and make it accessible, but also preserve mm -hmm. the originals. Because, I mean, we know digital is not forever. And I hope they consider that in the UK as the reality as well. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Uh, I'm just going through some new questions that have come in uh, since we started the Q&A time. Sure. Um, let me see here. Hopefully, this would be a good one to go over. Uh, so German uh, Mennonite immigrants in Pennsylvania. So uh, Dahlia is asking about any kind of resources for the Mennonite population in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania colony. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, do you guys have some re research uh, or um, some, well, some databases again, and records for that? Turning back to our research center for the books and the journals and whatnot, it's probably yeah. the best source for that. Again, look at American ancestors and put in Pennsylvania, put in Mennonite, the keyword. See what comes up. See what we come up with, both our library catalog as well as our database. And again, look at those external databases because they're going to cover beyond our scope and, and has global outreach besides just you know looking for Pennsylvania newspapers. Um, one of the things I, again, uh, our partner with Family Search, look at Family Search drill down to the towns, drill into the counties, look for, you know, town records, court records, you know, and even church records if they've been digitized. Um, reach out to your local and state of Pennsylvania, state library and archives, see what's available there, and also in local county and town historical societies. Most most historical societies and towns are gonna be a gold mine of information. My own hometown historical society has diaries from the revolution, the civil war, uh, oh, wow. Original records back almost 300 years ago, they're not online, they're not on microfilm. They've been in our historical society since 1895. The only time it gets digitized is when I take a picture of something and put it on our website or on our social media. Right. So local resources, you know, we try to think global, like the dot coms or organizations like American Ancestors are going to have everything. But if you don't yeah. find it in our catalog, don't give up because you just don't find it there. Drill down to where the source is. One of the best resources I can give anybody, and this is applicable to really anything US and Canada or even European or whatever, call the local library or the coverage that town or that region mm. and ask them who the local genealogist or historian is. Because I can tell you the reference librarian may not be one. And they're gonna know on their hotline who to contact via email, drop them a note, join the local historical society for 10 or $20 for the year to get their newsletter. And you might find with a small donation, they may be able to, you know, find what you're looking for or tell you where the household is or where the church mm -hmm. records are for the Mennonites. Um, but, and again, American ancestors are asking genealogists, pop the question right in there. They'll have access yeah. to all the things right in front of us versus me talking with Tom live, which yeah, I'm yeah. obviously <laughs> home, uh, that I can't tell you everything, but uh, our Ask a Genealogist team will go to bat for me on that one. That's, that's a great resource. I wasn't aware of that. You said it's a free thing that you guys offer. So mm -hmm. it's through your, uh, and is that through your website they do that or they, they call in? Right. You can, uh, it's not a call service. It's uh, pretty much it's a chat. It's almost like you, oh, chat. Like okay. you're going to be chatting with someone who lives pretty much in, in the United States that's on our, yeah. who works for us, mostly our employees of our research service and library uh, that have certain days. Um, my department just changed in August, but I was doing this like it would be like every day of a certain a certain amount of hours, I would be on there mm -hmm. answering chats and the person would give okay. me questions. So let's like you're getting now, Tom, and we just yeah. type an answer, send them a link, send them a, a guide or something. Yeah, yeah. Help them. I mean, we can't break down a brick wall often in 15 minutes. Yeah. We're gonna try. Yeah. You can point point them in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. So I. So those of you that are, are on this webinar and listening and you've asked a question that I haven't answered, there's there's a lot of kind of brick wall questions that have come in that we're not going to be able to cover them all. And it sounds like that uh, American Ancestors, Ask a Genealogist chat could be a great way to get some direction on how to take that next step. And if you're going uh, to Roots Tech, come by booth 411. I'll be there when I'm not lecturing and I can glad to take the questions in person too. There you go. There you go. David will be there. Uh, Jedmatch will be there as well. Booth uh, 1120 will be right near the Family Search booth. So uh, yeah, looking forward to that next week. Um, here's an interesting one. It, it's kind of a broad question, but I think it'd be good to touch on. 
Any ideas for resources? And this is Megan who asked this. Any ideas for resources for finding U.S. naturalization records? Um, I have this question personally from my great grandfather. Like, to try and find his sure. naturalization record. I haven't found it yet. But where do you where do you start if you want to try and find those? All right. So starting in 1906, the and going forward, it's a lot easier because they're in one okay. centralized place. That you, um, you're going to find the state will have you know sort of centralized it. Before 1906, going back to the early 1790s, it could be in a police court, a district court, a superior court. Mm -hmm. There's five or six different options your ancestor may have had in his state or even his region or more that he mm -hmm. could have gone or, uh, or if it was a lady, because I mean, women did naturalize as well. If they were in business for themselves, you know, you don't have to think of 1920 as being the sole purpose. If she was in business for herself, she could have been an Irish immigrant. She opened up a dress shop and she wanted to become you know, naturalized, she could have applied. So hmm. where are these records? Ancestry.com okay. and Hold3. Of course, they're a partnered, again, same company, two different websites. They are, the Fold3 aspect is working to get the digitized records. Now, in many cases, if you don't have a Fold3 or an Ancestry, what I would do is I would go on to, um, say, for instance, the state they live in. Go to Family Search Wiki. Uh, family Search Wiki is free, and you can put in mm -hmm. the state. So you go to Google and put Family Search Wiki, Minnesota, and then when you open that research guide, again, it's a Wikipedia type page on their Family Search's Wiki. It will give you immigration naturalization, and if they've already digitized and it's a searchable database, many of these databases um, for naturalization, you. And I'm again, I think Ancestry and Full Three are wonderful sites, but if you can get it for free and you want to look at the same record, see if Family Search has it first, and then go in and take a look, click on it. Um, ranges of years are what you're mostly are trying to find. The more recent naturalizations, so say for instance, 1930s, 40s, 50s, these may not be digitized yet in a lot of regions. So mm -hmm. turn to your local National Archives regional branch. So here in New England, all of our regional branches and for Waltham, Massachusetts, covers all the New England states, even has records as far away as you know Southern Connecticut. Find the regional branch because they are all under the, um, the umbrella of the National Archives, but they will have regional repositories like these that will have the original bound naturalization books or sheets of paper. Some cases even have photos of our ancestors. But if you can get it from Family Search. Ancestry or Fold3 or for more recent ones, I would definitely look at um, what the regional archive is for national archives in your area. They may have the more recent ones and they probably have the originals as well. So you might wanna go there and not just look at a black and white image, look at a hand, you know, a colored image with a photograph, which would be a lot easier. Yeah. All right. Uh, we had a couple of questions around basically storing your research you know digital is kind of easy you know it's easy to back that up and do that in multiple ways oh, yeah. but what about uh physical papers documents do you guys have a recommended way for people to store that um and and then yeah. someone else asked hey you know digital copies might not last so should i make a master copy of my findings and save it All right, we got a thumb drive right here uh, a thumb drive the simplest device for under twenty dollars you can buy a lot of you know, a gig, you might even be able to get a terabyte for Lots $20. Of gigs. Now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, back up your material. If you're using cloud storage that you're paying for, or don't rely on your computer's hard drive. Do as I say, not as I do, because mm -hmm. I lost a computer a number of years ago. Pictures, emails, gone. We mm -hmm. live in such a digital age, Tom. I, I give a lecture called What Time Is It On Your Genealogical Clock? Is that as a society, we're taking digital pictures. I mean, I have thousands of Roots Tech selfies and other pictures yeah, yeah. around the country that I've done. I don't have to print it out. I don't even have the metadata unless I posted it on social media to say, this is mm -hmm. me with Tom. Yeah, so that means we have to get a selfie now. Uh, For sure. <laughs> so, you know, you want, you're relying electronically. Same thing is true with emails. I mean, we're not printing things out. We're not keeping journals. We're keeping digital calendars. You want to take and back up periodically your data, not just mm -hmm. once, but twice. And if you have a safety deposit box or a fireproof, mm -hmm. you know, keep your deed in or your last will and testament, periodically back that up and put one in there. I keep one of these at work. 
right now, even though the building's closed, I have 10 years of backup on a portable hard drive. I mean, you can buy portable yeah. hard drives too. And the other thing to guarantee you're not going to lose it, share your information. Nobody's become a millionaire collecting you genealogical information. Yeah. You know, hoarding genealogy is selfish and also can be self-destructive. If your yeah. house burns down, you lose your computer, but you know yeah. that you shared it with your cousin Mary, and you can get Mary and say, Mary, my computer crashed, or worse, they can get you a backup, and you don't have mm -hmm. to start from ground zero. Online trees, another thing. Family Search offers online trees. American Ancestors offers ancestry trees on our that you can upload your tree. Um, there's you know so many different storage opportunities for photos like mm -hmm. Forever and others you know just you know like um, Smug Mug. Uh, I'm gonna remember Smug Mug. I think it is. Anyways, there's oh, yeah, a lot, lot of different out there like that. options. Yeah. Put pictures online. So there are options. You don't have to do it yourself and you can have it set to digitally do it. But the yeah. most easiest way, back it up and once in a while, send a link to your OneDrive or whatever to your cousin and mm -hmm. say, hey, wanna, here, I want to share this with you. Print it out mm -hmm. is the other thing that's important. Because again, we don't know what the shelf life of these are. I mean, we have, they haven't been yeah. around 100 years. We don't know if we're, I mean, furthermore, in this, in the early 80s, my computer had a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. <laughs> I, if I didn't go to three and a half, then go to CD-ROM, then go to one of these, and then go to cloud storage, that data would yeah. be gone. So I wouldn't be, gone. I mean, I probably could find one in a museum. But what will our descendants do when they open up that trunk, Tom, and they see this thumb drive? Like, what is that going to? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if they're going to be, if folks are printing things out, doing, doing a paper version of their digital. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you guys do you have a recommended way to store that? Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, it could be a lot of information, a lot of. Sure. Um, uh, there. I mean, if you are in a roots tech, you'll find a lot of different uh, preservation options. But yeah. one of the companies, and again, this is not you know one that we partner with per se. Um, Gaylord is a company that has archival supplies and many archives, including mm -hmm. ours, will buy Hollinger boxes. These are um. I'm going to see if I had one handy, I'd show it because I happen to have one the other day, but I think it's oh, in, cool. the in the corner. Uh, in that, you have acid free folders. You just put oh, your okay. papers in that acid free non PVC uh, sleeves that you put your photographs in. I mean, mm. how many of us have pictures when we were kids in the old magnetic photo albums? Have you ever tried to remove oh, yeah. those? You leave half the yeah. photo behind. So, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways um, of preserving uh, and printing out. Uh, and having that backup. And then again, you need to think about who is your academic heir, essentially. Who is going to take mm. on your papers? I have two daughters, and I love them to pieces. Neither of them are genealogists. So mm -hmm. in my will, I have anything that's of local history, because I'm the town historian in my town, will go to the mm -hmm. historical society. Anything that's genealogical that the family doesn't want will go to the um, American Ancestors archives, my papers, right. my books. And that way it lives on and it's not yeah. lost. The saddest story I tell during the, uh, what time is it on your genealogical clock, is an 87 year old friend who lived out in Illinois. She had daguerreotype, the earliest form of photography. She had journals, diaries, tintypes, letters. And when she died, her family lived in um, Maryland they had someone come in to clean out the house, a junk mm. antique dealer. And they said, well, everything that she had was on an online website. I think they, Ancestry. But not to have the heirlooms, to have the pictures, because you don't know if she did everything. So yeah, yeah. find a place that you know that it may be a child, a nephew or a niece or a grandchild, mm -hmm. a local historical society, someplace that, I mean, we, we don't know when our time's up, so having mm -hmm. a post-it note on your binder or having something next to your thumb drive, these files are not junk. This is your answer. Yeah. Please do something yeah. with them and back them up, you know. So yeah. that's probably the best advice I can give. And if, if they uh, feel like you're not going to have a place for it, American Ancestors is another repository. Uh, you can contact us and we can tell you if that's something in our collection scope. There you go. Well, David, I think uh, we, we've hit our time. Um, this has been great. Really, oh, it's been a pleasure. 
really great, uh, you know, knowledge you've been able to share, um, insights and, you know, some of these steps people can take to hopefully uh, break through some of their brick walls. Obviously, all the resources you guys have at American Ancestors uh, is something I hope our members will dig into and check out and take advantage of what you guys offer. Um, so really appreciate you being with us. Uh, any um, any parting thoughts that you might want to share? Genealogy wasn't done in a day, and it wasn't all done on online. Sometimes it means going to the cemeteries. The, the best part of genealogy is your stories. So hmm. remember the story on how your parents met? Or your grandparents or that story that you heard but you know it's not written down tonight's tonight to write it down because again we're more than just names and dates if we just rely on you know a name and a date and a place it's a very boring genealogy i was seven years old when i got interested in this tom it's because my mm. grandmother told me her father was on a whaling ship and the idea that mm. my ancestor was a whaler intrigued me yeah. it just heard a child's <laughs> version of moby dick where the whale and the whaler became friends so how cool of it how cool was it for a seven-year-old to think my ancestor could have been friends with a whale but that right. was enough wow and for the past 48 years i've been working on tracing my family tree because of it so awesome david thank you thank Appreciate you your time we'll talk soon again all right until later all right thanks everyone that joined have a great day